these are new rides, that's a new ride, there's all new stuff coming along. The fair was much condensed in those days, now it stretches over a huge acreage, yes. Very odd though, but come and pick a winner. On, There's nothing to beat it. I mean, it's, it's a wonderful fair. There are three fairs in the country that claim to be the biggest in Europe. Goose Fair is one of them, and it's by far my favourite. And I think most people who attend Goose Fair, it's their favourite as well. You know, it's a wonderful place. And people come from all over the country, showmen, who I don't see the rest of the year. They come to Goose Fair, and I see them at Goose Fair once a year, you know, so it's brilliant, really good. I find this fair more stressful than most fairs. There's only, uh, it used to be three days, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. They've extended it now uh, to the five days that it is. It's less stressful now than what it used to be. But when it was just three days, whatever we could earn was in them three days. And everybody's looking at the weather, you're looking at the generators, you, you're waiting for something to go wrong all the time. I've always said it's we're ordinary people doing an extraordinary job. It's a job, and that's all. That's what it is. But I don't know. I don't think it's something you would take to as an outsider coming in because I mean it's beautiful today. The sun's shining. Everything's rosy in the garden. But when you're in the middle of a field in the summer and it's pouring down a rain, you can be up to your neck in mud and sludge and everything. It's not so romantic then. If you're not in it, it's not the kind of business you'd want to be in. It's very, very stressful. Uh, we work crazy hours. Like Saturday here, I'll be working from 8 in the morning. I'll finish here at 10, 11, then drive to Bridgewater, 200 miles, take me ride down there, and drive it from there to Wall, and try and get back here for 2 o'clock on Sunday, ready for opening again. And Sunday night, I'll close, pull this ride down, and move it straight through to Wall. So it's about two days, no sleep, and... Uh, Hopefully nothing will go wrong. When do you have to start preparing for this goose fair? July. It's, these are hand done and slow. I, 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 I work by myself. I do all of them and uh, I manage. Some of my best friends are a showman. They're, they're, once you get to know a showman and he's your friend, you've got a friend for life. He will be, he will be your friend for the whole of your life. If you're in trouble, he'll be the first to come and help you out. Contrary to public notion, it's not. But I haven't got a tattoo, or not that I'm criticising tattoos. I mean, people are quite entitled to have them, but it's uh, it's how we're depicted sometimes, you know. And I've argued that all my life from being at school when I used to be called names, but now I try to explain to people that we, we, we've got a nomadic lifestyle because of the business we're in, and that's all. That's the only reason we live in caravans, because it isn't feasible to transport you home everywhere you go, you know. Well, cocks on sticks, in actual fact, were made by my grandfather as far back as Eight, uh, about 18, 1872, and uh, we had a, he had a man, he set up a manufacturing business. Robin Hood was his trademark, and uh, he carried on making cocks on sticks until the First World War. Of course, there was no sugar around then, just like in the Second World War, had to be uh, abandoned during those times. But uh, I was in, uh, I, I came into the factory, I came into the, the business and an old chap came in, I'd never heard of Cox on Sticks myself and this old chap came in and apparently he worked for my grandfather and he said, why don't you make some Cox on Sticks Ray? I said, I've never heard of them. He said, I'll show you how to make one, which he did. And I took to it straight away and in 1952, uh, when sugar became plentiful, uh, I, be, I made them and I've made them ever since. So, 60 odd years of manufacture. Why a cock on a stick? Well, it's got more impetus than a goose on a stick. 
and I, I wouldn't know how to make a goose on a stick. <laughs> yeah. My dad had uh, shows here, small shows, uh, Siamese twins, the octopus uh, in a big tank with the lady in the, in, the, in the tank with the octopus. He first came here with uh, Frankenstein's Haunted Castle and uh, then he moved on to a fun house and he's still got the fun house now, he's, he's had it forever. All sorts of shows my dad had here, he had the flying bomb. Uh, the flying bomb was a bomb with wings and uh, during the war they used to fuel them up and set them off like gliders and when they when they run out of fuel they would crash so they used to calculate how far it would get and just fuel it up to that and the flying bomb used to go my dad told me stories from the war he was just about six, six seven years old he said you could hear them coming and you could hear them bup, 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 and then they go silent he said that was a time to panic because they'd run out of fuel and they were coming down my dad built one he made one, a replica, and, and advertised it, the flying bomb. People were scared to come in it, right? Because it might blow up. Right? It was, uh, he built it. We're not Animal Kingdom. Come on, let's have some more with us. Don't fall forward. Come on, come on. I've been attending Goose Fair for 42 years now. Uh, this has been my 43rd year, so uh, a long time, you know. I love it. I love the atmosphere. I love everything about it. I'm a uh, fifth generation, actually, of showmen. My family go back a long way, you know, from uh, over a hundred years. So it's quite some time. Yeah. Well, I went to approximately 15 different schools, which was difficult at times. Uh, and some of them were even Welsh schools as well, which Welsh speaking. And that got even more difficult then, of course, because I didn't speak Welsh. But it was hard to keep up, but you, we done our best. I mean, we, we're, uh, we're very uh, streetwise. Showman's children are very streetwise right from, right from being young, you know, so you're brought up that way. I had a model wall of death and an exhibition of pictures as part of the history. And I used to take it around steam rallies and a guy called Ken Fox he had his wall of death at a rally at Rempston. And this was about 1995, I think it was. Yes, because it's 20 years ago, this year would have been 95. And he had his, his wall of death there, and my model was in the tent. So he'd come over looking and we'd get talking. And on the Sunday morning at Rempston, he got all sorts of problems or something. I was on the front, hanging around, doing nothing, you know, still with my hands in my pockets. He was mending a, bar, a motorbike. Something else had gone wrong, somebody was round the back. So he just threw the microphone for me and said, oh, for goodness sake, you do it, we've got to open. I picked up the mic, opened my mouth, and I've done it for 20 years. Everything was overwhelming as a child. All the lights and the roundabouts and the little flying birds. And then they had little... Um, Mickey Mouse's on wheels that you pushed along with a stick. It was, it really was magic. I remember a lot of shows being on the side here. Jimmy Appleton was here with the, uh, the midget. Um, there was George the Gentle Giant. He, he was just over, over there. I, I used to know George uh, personally and uh, he passed away maybe 15, 20 years ago and that was the end of that uh, that, that sideshow, there was nobody to replace it with. He was a lovely big man, he was a gentle giant, that's exactly what he was. He was about seven foot six, uh, he was a massive giant of a man. Uh, it was his size that had him in the end. It, uh, his bodily function has closed down. Well, in those days, they had uh, a lot of freaks. I remember there were some twin horses and they were no bigger than a dog. They were fully grown. Look, looked like the, a race horse breed. Yeah, incredible they were. Uh, and you had um, people with no arms knitting. Incredible. They were knitting with the feet. I remember one huge display was advertising the the bones of Jesse James brought from the caves from America <laughs> incredible of course it was plaster of Paris <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> but they got away with it. But well, that's Ron Taylor himself. It, it, they were a whole show family, very famous family. And, and that's him on front of the boxing show, encouraging the people to come up, you know, and take on his fighters, you know, for a win 10 bob or whatever, would have been more then. Uh, but he was a, a really wonderful man and a great showman and, and, and a very good friend, as I say. He taught me to do what I did. I turned up at this steam rally that we were doing and he was next door to us with his, not with the boxing, but with a, some other equipment. He got a big wheel, I think it was, and some stuff. And when I saw Ron there, I thought, I'm off, I'm going home, because I can't compete with him. He'd be, you know, not Ron. And, you know, he was the nicest man I've ever met. For the whole of that weekend, he stood at the side of me on the front of the wall of death. He coaxed me, he taught me, he said, do this, lad, do this. All the time he was with me, right through it. And the last year I actually saw him before he died, he'd, he'd actually discharged himself from hospital because he was going to be with his show no matter what. He'd been in the hospital and he was absolutely determined he was going to be there and with his show. So he was with his show right to the very end. He, he died a couple of three months afterwards, you know. You've got well-known names in the business, the Hollands, the Proctors, Pat Collins, you know, all, all these famous people are on here. Mellers, of course, and they, they, they came from having stores and roundabouts to owning like that big star flyer over there now and, and the Wild Mouse. And they're an international company now, they? but their associations with Goose Fair go back hundreds of years, nearly everyone on here. I mean, round here is where sort of the last of the shows to come to Goose Fair would have been. That would have been in the 1980s, you know, the late 70s, 80s, into the 90s really. And around here you'd have Mouse Down just about as you go into the corner here. Then leading away, and I can't remember the exact order they were in now, but you would have had Ron Taylor's boxing booth, Betty Allen with the Snake Girl, George the Gentle Giant, you'd have had Tiny Tim the Midget, next door to each other they'd be. And you, you, you'd have had them, and also down the bottom there would have been a wall of death until the early 80s, the wall of death was here down there. So you, you did have a line of shows, but prior to that you'd have had the, you would have had the glamour shows, the strip shows in the 1950s, you know. Before that you'd have had menageries and zoos and, you know, families such as Weeklies, Proctors. They all had shows on here, you know. I mean, behind us here is John Proctor's Dodge, and well, when the Goose Fair moved onto here in 1929, John Proctor's grandfather had a huge circus as part of the fair because he, he was a circus man as well as a showman. He, he, was, he, he did both. He had rides and a circus. And they said it was over an acre, this circus. The ones I knew best, I mean, Jimmy Wheatley, I know with his mice. Literally, it, it had lots of little mice in it and it was just full. They had a little big wheel and they just ran around and played. You know, you went in and you watched. The kids loved it, you know. He'd reached the point where people were bringing their grandkids to see it because they'd seen it when they were a baby. Everybody knows everybody virtually, you know, really. And except the children. I look at the children and try to guess who the parents are, you know, so by looking at the faces. But uh, yeah, generally speaking, we all know one another and we all meet up for this time of year. It's brilliant. When you look at the old films from years ago, everybody seemed to have a top hat or a bowler on, didn't they? And it was a, it was a big occasion, the Goose Fair. And it moved from the old Market Square, I think, in 1929. So it's, we've, been, we've been on this site now for approaching 100 years, you know. So it's a long while. I'm getting used to it. There were steam-driven rides in those days. Um, and then it progressed to the, what you see now, which is high-flying fast moving monstrosities <laughs> oh it's a multicultural city now isn't it Nottingham I mean it's, 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 that's why what makes it so vibrant I think you know because that's what I'm, when I'm on my stall 
there's all nationalities coming up and, and, and coming to talk to me and have a go and that, you know, and it's, I think it's a wonderful place, I really do. I've, I've never seen any real trouble. There were about 20 lads came down, marching down here, this path. We are the greatest, all of them. We are the greatest. And there's a pavilion there which the police held as, as their office. They all came out and they went to the barrier, there was a barrier across, back. And, the lead, and the, one of the leading chaps said, why? And the policeman hit him on the shoulder, that's why, <laughs> and they all went back. <laughs> it, was, it was quelled before it started. <laughs> yeah, incredible. The actual shows where people came and entertained the Wild West show, um, all that finished eventually, all just, uh, everything went, all those was replaced with ghost trains, fun houses, rotors. My dad was coming here long before me, uh, maybe 40 years ago, and uh, he actually, when they put the tramways down, he lost his ground from down the bottom there and uh, he moved on and he never came back. But uh, I've kept coming back on this position at the top here. But uh, it's a shame really because my dad uh, would have been one of the oldest tenants here. We've got a big change at Goose Fair this year. We've got a, a licensed bar on site, which is, I think is a wonderful addition. I go to the fairs on the continent and the beer kellers and the, and, and the bars are part of the, of the fair. And I think it'll be a brilliant thing. I hope it will. You know, I think it's wonderful to see. You can go and have a sit down, have a drink if you want, and, uh, and relax for a little while. Which I think, so that's a big thing this year. And we're moving all the while. There's always something new at Goose Fair, always. We just, we just go on modernising uh, uh, what I used to like is old hat to people these days. Yeah, I used to go on the roundabouts, the big wheel. There's a big wheel still here, well, the kiddies roundabouts are still here. Uh, but many of the novelties sold in those days intrigued me as a little boy, you see. Yeah, yeah. The flying birds they considered, because they wave them about, you might catch somebody's eye, they were banned. And, and so this is, this is for the better, I suppose, really. But um, it, yes, it's a long history. This is a tradition, just as the toffee apples are, mushy peas. To be quite honest with you, I'd much rather have been a professional golfer, but that was never going to happen. So I, showman is what I am and that's what I'll always be. And we don't retire, you know. Showmen don't retire. Generally speaking, we die. <laughs> we don't retire. And I won't retire, I don't think. You know, I'm 64 now and I can't see... I don't think I'll be thinking of retirement any time in the near future. I'm retired, I only do this. Nothing else. No. I've been retired for um, oh, 20, 20 odd years. I've been retired. I do this for, I, I do this out of nostalgia, if you like. Yeah, and many, many people keep coming. You're not going to retire, they say. That you're not going to retire. People from, I had a, an old chap came earlier. I'd known him for 50 years. He said, I'm glad you're still here. Yeah, yeah. last forever. Goose Fair, well, you, you, you don't get this amount of visitors to an event and then it, it would ever stop. I mean, we're looking at approximately 400,000 people coming to Goose Fair. That's a lot of people. That's more than attend Nottingham Forest home games all season. You know, so it's a, it's a big event. It's the biggest event in the city 
The Riverside Festival is a wonderful event, but this is bigger than the Riverside. Goose Fair, because of nostalgia, will go on forever. Changed in character, no doubt about it. But uh, this is something that will remain. Robin Hood, of course, will always attract people here. Any showman you talk to on here, or the vast majority of them, they'll all tell you about the history on here, how many years they've been coming here, and the, the fathers came and the grandparents came. They have a very, very long history. Being showman and also with Goose Fair itself, something they're very proud of, I think you'll find. You know, they're, they're proud to be here. They're, it's always an honour for them to come here. You know, it's still one of the, if not the leading fair in the country. Yes, sir. You know, you get the atmosphere in here on a Friday and Saturday night. It's something that can't be beat, you know. I've known Goose Fair's rain every minute of the day, all day, all through the fair. In 1958, this happened. And it didn't just rain, it sailed down. It, well, that was incredible. But they still came. Didn't, I don't suppose they stayed long. The crowds, you were shoulder to shoulder all the time, shoulder to shoulder, and that was half the fun. Possibly one or two got the pockets picked. <laughs>